So if you would like to turn with me, please, to Acts and chapter 4, and we are going to read verses 13 to 22. Hmm. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 down to 22. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Lord, we just pray you'd bless Henry. Fill him with your Holy Spirit now as he comes to share with us. May we hear your word for us today. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Going to shuffle back so you can see my head. Ah, okay, great to be here. Um, it, it's amazing to share from this passage. I'm just going to dive straight in as to what is happening at this point. We've got Peter and John being talked about, being questioned, being interrogated about what's happening. Just if you remember, actually for them it was yesterday. For us it was about a month ago. Uh, they thought they were going to a prayer meeting, but then they ended up meeting this man uh, who had been there, who was begging, uh, and who was disabled. They've prayed for him. He's been healed in the name of Jesus. They've stood up and preached an impromptu sermon all about the resurrection and how Jesus has conquered death. Then they've been arrested, thrown into prison. Uh, they've been questioned and talked to uh, a number of times already. And now what we've reached today is after that little message that they've given in their defense, as they've talked about Jesus even more in front of lots of the authorities, we're now going to see what happens to that. How are they going to react? And as you read it, and as you see it, and as you take it in today, I hope you're going to be in as inspired as I am. Because instead of just saying the right stuff, instead of just giving the clever answer, instead of just doing the right things, they actually stand firm on them as well. What I want to say today is that they are two people who stand in the name of Jesus. They don't just say it. They don't just know the answers. They don't just give the clever thoughts, but they stand in the name of Jesus. And what I want to do is challenge you today. Are you going to be like that? Are you going to be one who says the truths about Jesus, speaks them out, declares them, and then stays faithful to them, stands on them? This is our question today. Are they going to manage that? And the answer is yes. It's really awesome. The way they observe these two men is that they have this confidence. In fact, I want to use two C's. They have confidence and not credentials. They're those men who are not just um, those who have learned what they're talking about, but they've really lived it. They have a confidence in who God is. This is obviously in comparison to all the people they're talking to. And we're going to think a bit more about that in a moment. There's lots of important people, lots of groups of important people, six of them, in fact, that are, are talking to them and that have been involved in this arrest and this interrogation that's going on. And there's a stark comparison. They look at Peter and John and say, these guys are not qualified. They don't have the credentials that we have. They just seem to have an enormous amount of confidence and boldness in the things that they're saying about Jesus. And that is an awesome thing. And that's something that I want to have in Jesus. Do you want that? 
That's something that I want to grow in, in Jesus. And as we already heard about from uh, Debbie and Zoe, that's something that comes from spending time with Jesus. I love how that is in this passage. They recognize them as having been with Jesus. It doesn't exactly say what they mean by that. Is it that they recognize them from the times of Jesus' ministry, moving around together? Maybe. Is it that they recognize the fact that the way that they do the kind of ministry that they're doing looks exactly like Jesus? Maybe some of these authorities had engaged a bit with Jesus. Maybe they're some of the ones who had observed Jesus and taken part in seeing him crucified. And that is really awesome. There is an awesome kind of confidence. It's not a bad kind of confidence. I don't know about you, but during this time of lockdown, we've been exploring some things and activities in the UK that we haven't done for a while. And uh, we've been to a few of those kind of places where it's a, a, a trust or a park or something like that. And you never quite know what the parking restrictions are. You know what I mean? Who do you pay and how do you pay and where do you park and where's the machine and now there's mobile apps. And uh, sometimes when you arrive at the car park, it, you just got to have a kind of confidence and look like you know you're allowed to be there and they just usher you through. I'm very good at that kind of confidence. Lydia's terrible at it. Um, but that's not the kind of confidence that we're talking about here. This is actually a real deep kind of boldness and confidence that Peter and John have in the name of Jesus and that we need to have. And as we're thinking about them not being qualified, not being credentialed in their life, they don't have all kinds of things. It made me think about uh, my qualifications. I'm a musician. I'm a drummer. I went to university to study music. Um, and when I was there, I was at Leeds University, which is a massive university. Uh, and there were loads of people studying music, studying all kinds of stuff, flutes and oboes and bassoons and all that. Uh, and drummers that year, there were three of us. And, uh, and we were the three drummers. Immedi immediately when you're there, you, you, you're looking at each other. You're, you're figuring out, is he better than me or not? Obviously, we were all uh, lads and didn't wash enough, those typical drummer things. Um, but there, there was a real kind of thought, you know, how... Are we going to do this? We had three years in this uni with amazing equipment to use and a tutor that was brilliant who could teach us uh, to become better drummers. Uh, and these guys, they bagsied some rooms in the music department to put their drum kits in and practice. Uh, and they were so serious about drums. They would just get in there and they would just be all these exercises, all these things. And to be honest, for the three years I was there, I barely saw these two guys because they were so dedicated to learning and practicing drums. It was very challenging to me. So I tried to do the same. I set my kit up and I practiced, practiced, practiced as much as I possibly could. Uh, it was a, a big deal. But also, uh, while I was there, um, I carried on doing as much as I could with, with church. And back here in London, I would travel back a lot so that I could keep drumming in church and keep sharing uh, in the life of church together. And that, it was amazing because I got to then travel um, around the world drumming in lots of different ways and lots of different events and that all came through church and then there were some Christian musicians I met at Leeds uh, and we formed a little band and started playing as much as we could and I just loved drumming. Drumming was just my life for these three years and I'd practice in my little room and in my bedroom I'd practice with a tiny kind of noiseless drum uh, and I would get out and we started busking together um, and we were busking outside this huge Debenhams that's there in Leeds if you've ever been there and, uh, and we were doing great and uh, made more than 100 quid just in half an hour, just playing loads of jazz on the street, and they were loving it. And then there was a moment where the manager of Debenhams came out <laughs> to talk to us, and I thought, oh dear, what are we going to do? And the manager said, I love it. We've got a special promotion day tomorrow. I'll give you 500 quid if you come and play this jazz in our store. And we said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and we were just playing, playing, playing. And um, we, we, played, we moved around lots of the music venues in Leeds, played in nearly all of them. We had a great time. But then it came to the end of my time, the end of my degree, my three years, uh, and we had to go and do our music examination. It was 30% of our degree mark, um, and I was freaking out. <laughs> but they showed us what we could do, and one of the options was play some jazz uh, as part of your performance, bring in some other musicians. This was perfect. I had these two guys that I'd been playing jazz with for three years. I brought them in. We had 100 tracks to choose from, so we just chose one and, and played it, and it was great. Um, and, and the, the examiners looked impressed, I thought, but usually they have a very stern face, don't they? But then the other guys came in, and the first guy stood up, uh, well, sat down, actually, on the drums, and, and played another jazz tune, which is just different to my one, and it was, it was awesome. 
you could see his hands are moving and flying, and they were all very focused and dedicated, and it was the cleanest, neatest jazz performance. It was awesome. So inspired by this guy. And then the other guy got up, and he sat down, and, and what was strange was he didn't have a band with him. He had exactly the same band as the last guy. He sat down, began to play, and it was, oh, it was exactly the same as the guy before. <laughs> Literally, note for note, hit for hit, all these things that looked like they'd been dynamic, exciting jazz uh, with the band were all pre-made notes. It was quite a shock. As he played, it was hit for hit, note for note, snare for snare, exactly the same jazz as guy number one. I see, I, I, I can't even remember their name. <laughs> and it was a real shock to me and to the examiners and everyone there. And as the marks came back, I felt so sorry for these two guys. Because their marks, even though they dedicated themselves, they probably battered their eardrum doing those exercises in their bedrooms and in their little studio at the music department. They hadn't had any real music experience at all. They hadn't played anywhere. They hadn't gotten out there and they hadn't, like me, had the privilege of church and being part of church groups to be able to play that music together. You see, all their music had been hidden in the academic. It had been hidden in practice, it had been hidden in reading and studying, and there was no confidence to be able to truly live in that music. They had none of those rhythms of spending time with others and playing together. And what I want to say to you today, that is the confidence that we need to have in Jesus. That is the boldness that we can have. For me, I was able to just flow with that music because I had lived it and because it had become part of my life. It had become my heartbeat. My timing was able to be really good because I lived in the music. And what I want to say is live in a rhythm of life with Jesus. Just as you saw Zoe just now, a rhythm of worship, a rhythm of listening to God, a rhythm of reading your Bible. Get into it in your bedroom on your own, but get into it out loud as well. Are you talking? Are you sharing? Are you testing out the things that you've read in the Bible that morning? Are you able to chat to the person that you're sitting next to at the bus stop and share about it? That was something that Phil Tate told me about when he did Radnet here in Forest Hill. He said he'd sit and listen to the, uh, the messages and the sessions from Roger, write them down, try to take them in and have them in his memory. And then during the lunch break, he'd go down to Forest Hill Station and find the nearest person and try to use what he'd just learned from Roger to share the gospel with them, to make sure that he fully understood it. Isn't that awesome? That is confidence. That is boldness. None of them are prepared for this. Peter and John thought they were going to a prayer meeting and it became a preach that we're still reading about 2,000 years later. It became a healing an interrogation and another preach in front of these, all these authorities. The first major clash that the church is having with all these authorities after the ascension. That is amazing. I want to encourage you. Get in the rhythm. Get in the groove. Get in the dance of life with Jesus so that you can grow in confidence with him. Amen? I want to encourage you to get down and read the word. Study it. Take it into you so that you can be full of confidence and boldness. It's far better than just some good credentials. Is my head getting cut off on my PowerPoint? I'll scooch that way too. There we go. <laughs> Let's move on because there's this great moment in the next verse, uh, verse 14, which is that as they're going through these questions, as they're talking to this council, that somehow the guy who got healed seems to be allowed to stand beside them. We don't know why this is. Is it because he was kind of brought in as a witness or <laughs> is it because uh, he just didn't want to let them go? Maybe it's because they said to him, hey, come and stand with us. This guy who had the reputation of begging for 40 years, that had become who he was. He was someone who, by definition, his identity was, I have nothing, and I have to take stuff from others. Someone who had totally been lost. Someone who, in a sense, was living in a hopeless way because it was just for scraps that other people passed on to him. He had been turned around by the power of the name of Jesus. And what I want to say about these guys, about Peter and John, is that they are standing with him. They're standing with the poor. In fact, I want to say they're standing with the poor and not a program. Others might have had a program or a system or a way that they could give things to the poor, but that's not what they have. They literally have this poor guy. They literally have this hopeless guy who had literally just been healed standing beside them. The healing had happened yesterday, but even today, they are standing with him. And that is another thing as to what it means to stand in the name of Jesus. First, you've got to stand with confidence. Second, you've got to stand 
with the poor. It was one of the most inspiring things that I heard from Roger and Faith as they shared about the history of Ichthus. Why did this church begin? Why did we as a movement come into being? And one of the main things they said was many others were thinking about evangelizing in that time, but there was no one to hold on to those who got saved. There was no one to take hold of those who got saved and really help them to become the disciples of Jesus that they should be. And that inspired me so much. We need to be those who stand with the poor. Not just a good program for how we help them, but actually to stand with the poor. If there's someone who says that they're a friend of Jesus and they really mean it, then they're a friend of mine. Maybe that's challenging for you. Maybe you don't want other people to know that messed up people who are finding Jesus and getting saved are your friends. Maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you've got a reputation that doesn't fit with that. I want to challenge you. Don't uh, compromise your faith to fit your reputation, but change who you think you are so that you can stand with the poor like Peter and John are doing here. If you're going to stand in the name of Jesus, stand with the poor, not just a program that's going to help people, but actually those people themselves. Bring them in to the heart of our churches. Do you want to do that? I want to do that. And actually this man's life even more than being someone who is now able to stand with these apostles that we're still loving and serving and learning about all these years later. But actually, his life becomes a sign, becomes a sign for that time. And his life becomes something that demonstrates what is happening in the time as this gospel goes forward. It's a sign of the kingdom of God. And uh, Jesus has a lot to say. To those, there's, I think there's another slide about that. You can flick it up if you want. <laughs> there we go. His life is a sign for the time. That's what this healing is all about. And actually, what is happening in these moments is really huge. All these authorities that are coming and talking to them are stirred up because it's the power of the kingdom that is at work through Peter and John into this man's life. And there's something very deep about the kingdom of Jesus that is being expressed here that I want us to take a few minutes to take hold of. You see, every miracle that we have is not an end in itself. Every miracle that we experience then and now is not an end uh, in itself. Our faith is not built on what miracle can God give me. I'm sure you know that already. But the way Jesus described them, he said, these are the signs, the signs of the kingdom. And again, Maybe like me, you've done a small amount of driving around during this lockdown phase. And uh, what I love is, is when you're driving, much better than uh, motorways in, in some other countries. We're, we're very good at motorway signs in the UK. We love them. And uh, they show you what's coming up. And what I love is, uh, is the service station. There's a, there's a, I think, are, they, are they green or blue? I can't remember. But they have a little logo and they tell you what's coming up <laughs> at the service station. The sign says, you know, here's a little coffee cup. At the services, you're going to have a coffee. <laughs> and there's a, a, a knife and fork like this. You can have something to eat. Uh, there's a toilet. You know, you can go to the loo and you can get the petrol that you need. And uh, there's all those things. And the sign is letting you know the goodness of the service station that is before you. <laughs> that hope as you're endlessly driving down the M whatever. <laughs> Please give me a break. <laughs> and you desperately want to get there. And the sign is letting you know what's there. And what I want to say is in this miracle, And in this clash that Peter and John are having with the authorities around them, there are many signs of the kingdom that we can get really excited about. Some people look at this stuff and they see this clash with the authorities and their conclusion is immediately, oh, they're all against us. Everyone's against us. We're trying to live out for Jesus and we've just got enemies on every side. And while that can be true in some places, that's not the way we want to understand it. That shouldn't be our theology of how we think about this world. Actually, what's happened is this man has been healed. This powerful miracle is a sign of the kingdom. And some of the things of the kingdom that aren't right in the world are getting stirred up. And we can see that in all the people who are part of this arrest and night in prison and interrogation that's going on with Peter and John. We can take a closer look. Here's the first three of them. If we look back uh, into verse 1 for a moment, we see that there's three uh, sets of them listed. There's the priests, and then there's the guards, and then there's the Sadducees. And they rise up and are part of getting hold of Peter and John and saying, we don't like what's going on with you. We don't like the force and energy that's at work with, through your life. I wonder if they even 
discerned that? Probably not. There was just a reaction in them. And again, if you have a look at that list, the priests were worried because they were in charge of temple worship. But yet, in the miracle of what's happening with Jesus, people are starting to glorify God in an unconventional way. They're stepping out of what was normal and what was acceptable and what the priests were okay with and started glorifying in a new way because they've seen what Jesus has done. You can see that as you move down. Even by verse 21, they're still glorifying God. So there was a stirring up to say, hey, this is not quite what we're okay with. And there's a reaction against it. The guards, they're not happy either. It says that up to maybe 5,000 people. In fact, it says 5,000 men um, way back there in verse 4 had reacted and responded and become believers in Jesus to this miracle. And perhaps the temple guard were thinking, that's a lot of people, <laughs> 5,000 men plus their families. There could be a Jesus-led uh, Jesus army if we're not careful. But these guys were stirred up and saying, quick, let's try and squash it. Let's try and get it down. Because there was a reaction as to what might happen. There was a fear as to what might happen. The Sadducees themselves as well, they're listed there. And they were those who very much moved in the, the high end of society. And, uh, those who were rich, if they were rich in that time, the Sadducees would make friends with you. Because they were interested in wealth and power that they could make through the wealth. You see, all those things are having a reaction. If we go on to the next three, there's six of them in total. You can read in verse 5, there's another three of them, the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. And again, it's very obvious, but the rulers, they're worried about the politics of what's going to happen in these moments. The elders, they're worried about what's this going to do to our national identity as Israel. The scribes, these are the academics, the thinkers. They're worried about how on earth can we fit this into our theology of who Yahweh is and what on earth is going on in these moments. All six of those powers are surged up and are pushing against what's happening. They're all conflicts. And actually, I'm sure reading those, you can see that those different kinds of powers, those different kinds of pressures can come against us as the church today. You can look at those things and say, hey, these are the battles that we need to be fighting. Should we be out there looking for them? Should we be hunting out these enemies to begin to fight against them? Should we be those who are getting in the face? Should we be rabble rousers for Jesus? Is that what Peter and John are doing here? Absolutely not. We're going to look at that a bit more in a moment. But what I want to say is our calling is to be like Peter and John, to stand in the name of Jesus. It's not to go picking a fight with those who we think might be against us, but we want to rescue the lost sheep like this man who was there at the beautiful gate, we want to say, your life can be made beautiful through the kingdom of Jesus. And any powers and any pressures and anything within the culture that is going to come against you, we can see you set free from those things. And when there's a sign of the kingdom like this miracle going on, often there's going to be things that we're going to have to help people get through. And it is amazing when we see that happen. You know, when people get free in Jesus and are able to have true worship from the heart. You can see, if you go back to that first list of three for a moment, sometimes they get a bit confused. There's a wonderful lady at Lee Green called Nikki. Before she was saved, she used to have um, some Jehovah's Witnesses who would come and knock on her door very often. And uh, she didn't know how to get rid of them, so she'd always use a fake name or a different name every time <laughs> and not tell them who she was. And, um, but then after she'd become a believer, they came back and they began to talk to her and ask her. And suddenly she knew way more about Jesus. And they said, oh, goodness me, have you uh, started going to church? And she said, no, I am the church. <laughs> and she was so excited to be able to tell them, church is not a building. There's not a set way that we worship. Now we have Jesus with us in our home. And they did used to have, we used to have church gatherings in their home there in New Cross. And it was some of the best experiences uh, of serving Jesus with Nikki and her family. It's amazing. And all six of these, I haven't got time to go through them now, but they're getting redefined by the kingdom of God. And those conflicts aren't the things that we should be fighting against. Look at what Peter and John say. If we go a bit further down, and uh, they've started to tell them, listen, just stop it. The name of Jesus, just, just stop it. I love that they, these guys, the council, these different people, they, they've got no kind of reason They've got no way that, that they want to, you know, make these guys do it. They just say, please, can you just stop? <laughs> Whatever you're doing, just please just stop it because we're scared and we don't like it. 
Um, and then Peter and John say, respectfully, absolutely not. <laughs> we will not do it. But they say it in a way which is so interesting. They say, we're not the judges here. You judge for yourself. We don't know what's going on in your hearts. We don't want to overpower you, but we cannot stop doing this. We cannot stop preaching about Jesus. We cannot stop praying for miracles. We cannot stop. There is something awesome at work through us, and we can't stop doing it. It's not that they were just the kind of people who were really excited and you know, just, just kind of loved it. It wasn't that this was just a fun game. I don't imagine being in prison is very fun. But that's not what we're talking about here. They're saying there is a flow behind us. There is an overflow. And that's what they mean when they say we cannot stop doing this. I want to say that they've got an overflow flowing through them, but they're not trying to overpower those who we're talking to. There is an overflow, but not an overpowering. As I've already said, they had a, a huge potential army of people who were believing in Jesus. They really could have done some damage to all those different areas of life we've just looked at. But they didn't want to do that. They didn't need to do that because there is an overflow of the kingdom of God that is living in their lives. Let's look a little bit more about that. Because when we stand in the name of Jesus, it's not a static thing. It's not something where you stand in one place. But there is an overflow of the spirit of God, of the spirit-empowered kingdom life that surges through us. There's an overflow of worship right from the heart. People are worshipping from the heart as they see this miracle. And that sign of the kingdom is awesome. There's an overflow of victory. They're having victory over this sickness that has bound up this man. There is a powerful, there is a, a violence to the way they grab hold of him and bring him up and say, come on. And there's an energy of victory as he dances with Peter and John through the temple. There's a flow of evangelism in them. As they saw this guy healed, they didn't just focus on him, even though they did love him and keep him with them. They wanted to preach to everyone else as well. And the reason they can't stop doing this is because the energy and the power of the kingdom is surging through them. It's awesome. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Whenever um, we used to prepare to go and do an outreach in Thailand, we used to take our truck and pile all the PA and the drums and flyers and stuff to give out to the poor into the back of our truck and drive down to the main road right near where the church was to give it out. And before we left, I always felt absolutely exhausted and, uh, you know, had this feeling of, it. oh, I, don't, I really don't think we can do this today. <laughs> I just, I really, I'm knackered and, you know, it might rain and, you know, it's, let's just, let's not bother. There was always this feeling inside me that wanted to say that <laughs> and I had to fight it with every bit of my being. But then as soon as we'd arrived, about 15 minutes in, the energy and the life of the Holy Spirit would come into me in a way that was just always inexplicable. By the last song of the outreach, every time, we would all be jumping up and down <laughs> on the street as we worship Jesus because the energy and the life of evangelism was flowing through us. I've got three more if we've got time. There's three more that we can look at because there was a flow of miracles. There was a flow of miracles that was flowing through Peter and John. There was a miracle and another miracle and another miracle that we're going to see unfold through the book of Acts. That was a flow of signs of the kingdom that was happening. We want to see that today. Amen. We want to see a flow of more miracles. There was a flow of church growth. The family of God was swelling with more and more people. And there was a flow of revelation. You can hear it. Actually, this tiny preach, this mini preach that Peter's just done in front of this council is his third preach already in the book of Acts. And we're only in verse four. And as you look at the things he's saying and the things he's unpacking and the ways he's talking about it, it's beginning to unfold more and more. The more he speaks about Jesus, the more Jesus speaks to him. And there's a revelation of God, which is unpacking. And what I want to say to you today, if you want to stand in the name of Jesus, if you want to stand firm on the name of Jesus, start talking about it. Start sharing about it. Because the more you share, the more God will give you to share. And there will be a flow of revelation as we stand firm on the word of God. As I've already said, so many times, Peter and John could have done anything with this moment. They had thousands of people behind them ready to do the things that they said. In a way, they could have very easily built another revolution. They could have built another turnaround. They could have been another revolt against the powers, against 
uh, the Romans, against everything that was established around them. But they decide not to do that. They don't need to do that. They don't need to build a kingdom because we already have a kingdom. Amen? We're not looking to Jesus and saying, Lord, come and build your kingdom here. I'm afraid that song's a bit wrong because we need to bring in his kingdom here. Amen? Jesus is not planning a new pattern for how he wants his kingdom to be. We already have his kingdom in the power of the Spirit, with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is something we bring in. We take hold of it and we grab hold of it and we let it be released through us, the church. We are the agents of his kingdom. We are the people who flow with that kingdom power and life through us. And all we've got to do is stand and allow his kingdom to be brought in all around us. He wants to do that through you. He wants to do that through me. He wants us to stand in the name of Jesus. All those things are wonderfully redefined in Jesus. I want to encourage you today. Stand in the name of Jesus in whatever you're doing. There's only one way it can be achieved. And we saw it right at the beginning. We've already talked about it in the children's time. It's spending time with Jesus. Right there in verse 13, they recognized them. People saw them, that these were the guys who had been with Jesus. Yes, all those authorities and powers, they'd seen something of Jesus in his life. But when people recognize beauty and goodness in you, when they recognize a radical compassion, when they see that you're not trying to wrestle for power and build your own kingdom, you're not trying to overthrow the things that are wrong in this world, but there is a whole established kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus, where he reigns with goodness and beauty and compassion that is already built. It just needs to be brought in to this world. If those things make you afraid, if you are someone who looks at the powers of this world, looks at the violence, looks at the politics, looks at the mess of this world and says something's got to change, you already belong to a kingdom where all of that is beautiful, where you don't need to worry about wealth. You don't need to worry about safety. It all is expressed in the wonderful life of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hand back to Debbie. Lord Jesus, Lord, we just want to praise you, Lord, for you are the one who died and rose again. We want to thank you, Lord, that your spirit is poured out today to see healings, to see miracles, to see transformations. And Lord, we want to say today, Lord God, that you are everything we need. You are our hope, Lord Jesus. So Lord, if we are in fear, if we are worried, Lord, if we are confused at the things of this world, Lord, forgive us. We want to trust you. We want to stand firm in your name. Lord Jesus, we praise you today. Amen.